My name is uh, Herman Rosenfeld. I'm a member of the Free Transit Toronto and TTC Riders and uh, the Socialist Project and uh, numerous other stuff are around the city. Like a lot of retired people, I'm retired from the Canadian Auto Workers Education Department. For, I've been retired for about nine years. A lot of uh, folks of my generation <laughs> retired. I'm just as busy as I was before. So a little bit about the forum, I just want to introduce it. It was originated in the experiences of a number of us in the transit movement. Um, we had in cons we did deputations periodically and uh, we got involved in uh, obviously in different struggles and we constantly came up against a growing uniformity, a single voice in the various government and regulatory spaces that we had to interact with, advocating di either direct private management of public transit projects, not necessarily selling off the TTC, or through public-private partnerships of various sorts. And uh, the, it's, uh, it's, transit is becoming the, the new home of, uh, of the P3s. We noticed a lack of public capacity to manage key infrastructure projects because they had already outsourced, contracted out, or privatized a number of the resources necessary to do that, and their dependence on private contractors um, ended in failures at various times. Uh, just, just think of the uh, Leslie Street Barns and the uh, uh, those of us in the East End. It was clear to us that the ongoing movements against privatization, many of which are represented here in other areas, healthcare, education, housing, postal delivery, and above all, the impending sale at the time was impending of, 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 of hydro, of the 15% of Hydro One, and uh, behind the scenes preparations, and not so behind the scenes preparations, for a similar sale of uh, Toronto Hydro, both justified as a way of paying for public oh, transit, so to speak and demanded a co collective consultation of some sort. These movements were happening at the same time. We had no pretensions of coordinating them, but we, we thought we could create a space where we can exchange insights, collective experiences, learn how to talk to each other, and above all, to, how, to talk to people in communities uh, in Toronto and or throughout Ontario about why privatization is just as problematic and is a key enabler for other familiar attacks on our collective futures associated with this famous term neoliberalism. The ongoing attacks on the livelihoods and the collective survival of working class families and individuals and our institutions, precarious work, um, uh, um, attacks on public s s s services in particular, um, the conversion of needed public services originally conceived by us as protections against the ravages of private markets on working people into both investment targets for private investors and instruments of those very markets against us once they've been reinvested, along with a political environment which makes it real tough to be able to see through all the, uh, all the tangling and actually do something about it. And so much of this is tied to uh, the austerity starving the needs of working people by the low tax regime and in the transit movement we've heard them always talk about they can't tax at all for sure and then claiming that new public infrastructure can only be financed by the selling off of public resources or allowing them to be controlled by private interests. And there's a tension between ongoing austerity and the, the re reduction of program and government spending, and that means there's a backlog of necessary infrastructure spending on the one hand, and the other hand, the need for public spending to, re uh, public spending to rebuild it and to address the stagnant economy. Privatization only deepens this tension and work, worsens the dilemma, and this is being repeated in the city, in the province, and uh, in the federal government. Privatization and its twin deregulation have been features of so many areas of social life, and today we want to explore them, ask what we have in common and how they differ, what drives them, what we have to do to get people angry enough about them, to target it, and we know that when we talk to people about it, people get angry about it, and make challenging and essential focus of our movements. There are a few spaces to do this, and we brought together different activists from different movements, areas, and political orientations to collectively strategize and come away with a deepening commitment to this and challenging it. In the end, this is an effort to combine two com complementary things, but they're also contradictory things. On the one hand, building actual movements on the ground, getting people angry, organizing them, and collectively getting them to do certain kind of strategic tasks, but secondly, understanding what's driving it and the bigger political and ideological forces and structural forces driving it. And the two things, they go together to a certain extent, but sometimes uh, doing one is hard and makes it hard to do the other. 
and so we, we wanted to have a space to do this. We will have presentations on key privatization fronts, and Camilla Petrick will, will chair. So I'll pass things over to uh, Camilla. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Camilla Petrick. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful Sunday. Very nice to see so many people here. Uh, we're going to kick things off with our first panel that I'm going to be chairing slash moderating. We have four, five great speakers, uh, each of whom will have uh, about 15 minutes to speak, and then at the end we will have about 20 minutes, maybe half hour for questions. So I'm going to be waving at the speakers, giving them a two-minute warning, if that's okay. And we will begin with our speaker, who is a little bit off to the side. Was there? I'm not sure if you want to come join us here. Yeah, we yeah. can pull up another chair. He is currently the chair of the advisory committee for the Citizens Coalition Against Privatization. He's heavily involved in the fight against privatizing Hydro One by the provincial government. <coughs> and of course, as I'm sure a lot of you know, he was a de new democratic member of the Ontario legislature from 1990 to 2014, representing the downtown Toronto riding of Trinity Spadina and before that the old riding of Port York, and he was also a school trustee. Hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Camila. Yeah, yes. uh, and welcome everyone. I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, OPSU uh, and CUPE in terms of the work that they have been doing, uh, that we have been doing, that they have been doing on the, this file. Um, acknowledge uh, OPSU because they're the ones who have uh, uh, hired me on a part-time basis uh, uh, to do this. And their commitment is a commitment against privatization in general. And they felt very strongly that privatizing Harder One was a mistake and a problem. And they wanted us to set up a, a, a citizen coalition that was, to the extent possible, nonpartisan. And wherever we could across the province, we tried to involve a lot of uh, city councillors and other citizens who were not uh, directly linked uh, to a political party necessarily. I, I did my best uh, to do that. Uh, we have been somewhat successful, but not entirely successful all of the time. So. <clears throat> we, we've done our best to be as nonpartisan as we possibly can. And CUPE for their effort to, uh, to mobilize uh, municipalities across the board. And we know that there are about uh, 200 municipalities that have passed resolutions fighting the sale of Hydro One. And so much of that is due to the work that uh, CUPE has done. And so together we are opposing the sale of Hydro One. And uh, it remains to be seen how effective uh, we will be. Uh, as we go, um, and I'll get into that in a, in, a, in a second. But I want to talk briefly about uh, uh, our hydro system, uh, and probably all of you are aware, but maybe not. But the point is, we used to have a public system for over a hundred years. And some of you will remember that Adam Beck uh, fought uh, relentlessly to, uh, to, bring pub to bring hydro in public hands. There were 18 referendums, and he was the major player uh, as a former conservative uh, MPP and as a former mayor of London um, and he was successful after 18 referendums to bring public to bring hydro into public hands. This is the chart, uh, a little chart that Paul Cannert uh, uh, prepared for us. Uh, we, we have a bigger chart but um, it's not with me, it's with Paul. Um, and this is a little uh, illustration of what public hydro used to be. Prior to 1904, we had a private system, and the electricity was 10 cents kilowatt per hour, which was incredibly high, and only the very wealthy could afford uh, uh, private hydro. And you can see that once hydro came, whatever hydro existed at that time, once it came into public hands, uh, hydro remained for almost 100 years at 4 cents, 5 cents kilowatt an hour which is amazing. And we built a public system with what we have. And in my view, that's a powerful statement about what we can do publicly when governments uh, decide that there is an important role for things like hydro to be in public hands. And you will see a little arrow here starting in 1995-99. This is when Mike Harris got uh, elected. And that's when the partial deregulation and partial privatization of our hydro system came into play. And you could see the rates jump to, I think you see 17 cents, but in the last couple of months it, it went uh, to 19 cents uh, kilowatt an hour. And this happened while 
or during that regime where Mike Harris decided that privatizing the system was a great thing. You will recall at that time that Ernie Eves, who followed Mike Harris, was quite eager to sell Hydro One. And although he appeared on TVO saying uh, that he was happy that he didn't, at that time he and many others in government were quite happy to sell uh, Hydro One. But before, well, it was taken to Q, it was taken by QP uh, mostly uh, to court where they where they lost it and uh, they lost the fight uh, uh, to sell Hydro One, uh, and the government decided that they would uh, change the law to make it easier for them to sell. But Ernie Eves did not sell Hydro One prior to the 2003 election, and the reason for me is quite obvious. The polling at the time revealed that 94% of the people were opposed to Hydro One, and I, in my mind and his, it would have been foolhardy to have gone into an election in 2003 saying, we're going to sell Hydro One, and they didn't. It was good that they didn't. It was a public benefit to, to us all. But, um, uh, but it's not because they were not ideologically uh, inclined to, uh, to privatize the system. How did we get here? We get here because for the last 20 years, provincial and federal governments have been cutting corporate taxes and income taxes to the tune of billions of dollars. And what it means is, even though Darlington, the nuclear station, cost $14 billion prior to 1989 to build, which caused the debt and deficits of our, of our, uh, of our finances, when you cut corporate taxes and income taxes, it means you as a government have less money to deal with the problems that governments have to deal with. So what do you do when you have less money? Well, there are only three things in my mind that uh, governments do. They, uh, they increase user fees. That's the first thing they, they need to do to try to recoup some of the lost money. The province has about 400 or so, a little more, uh, ways of uh, imposing a user fee on things that people uh, use from the provincial government. But there's only so much you can raise by increasing user fees. And we argue that user fees are not very progressive. Because if uh, someone earns 200,000 or 100,000 or, or half a million versus someone who, pay, who earns $40,000 and they have to pay the same user fee, it's unfair to those who earn less. The people at the higher end can afford that user fee, but the people at the lower end can't. So there's a, a discriminatory uh, measure built in into user fees. But that's one of the things governments do to try to recoup some of the money. But it's not enough. So what else? What else do they, uh, do they do? They begin to cut social services, services of all kinds. And the minister, Charles Souza, quite happily saying, we are number 10 in per capita spending in the country. He says that with uh, cheerfulness and happiness, uh, as if to say that having the lowest per capita spending on services is a great thing. But we are last on every measure imaginable in the area of social services, including health, including education, including tuition fees, where we are number 10 in Canada in terms of uh, cost uh, to our tuition fees, and it's getting worse. And the third thing they do, if it's not enough to bring enough money into the, uh, into the pockets of government, they begin to privatize. And we saw Mike Harris uh, begin doing that in 1995, and it keeps going. And the Liberal government here decided in 2007 with the uh, the Clean Energy Act to privatize all renewables. But both governments are now into the game of uh, privatizing. And to be fair and to be critical to the, to the NDP, we, we started uh, the, uh, the privatization problem in 1992, uh, uh, 93 when we built the 407. It's good to admit that we, uh, we did that. Uh, we had a deficit of about uh, nine, ten billion dollars. We were criticized by corporate uh, uh, Canada, corporate Ontario, for uh, having reached a debt wall, the highest deficit in the land, and we were about to collapse. And so, of course, uh, uh, Bob Ray at the time thought, "What do we do?" Well, he they came up with a scheme of uh, involving uh, the private sector through public-private partnerships that most of us detest. Uh, but it was a way to offload uh, the cost 
to uh, another agency so that it didn't look bad in our books. But that's what begun that, that process. The idea was that after 25, 30 years, we would bring that into public hands. And little did we, forget, did, uh, uh, we uh, um, uh, remember that we're not going to be in government forever. And then when Mike Harris got uh, into power in 1995, he quite happily said, 25, 30 years, not good enough. We're not going to take it back. We're going to sell it for 100 years. Uh, the problem with the 407, of course, is that the private sector is making a huge amount of uh, money, uh, uh, and they only got about one and a half, two billion of profits out of the sale of 407, but we still had a debt when he left, about $5.5 billion. These are the great fiscal managers who had a great economy after 1994, 95, uh, but weren't able to bring down the deficit because they were, they were cutting services, they were cutting uh, uh, taxes, and at the end of it, of course, you still have a, a huge deficit. I'm racing through this to try to cover as much as I can. It's probably not a good thing, but uh, uh, I'm trying to cover uh, a lot of ground. Kathleen Wynne said prior to the election uh, very little about the sale of Hydro One. What she said during the election in the uh, campaign is that we're going to repurpose assets. And she makes it appear like repurposing assets is something that is very comprehensible to most human beings. If you say repurposing assets, do any of you understand what that means? Uh, except for Peter Tabbins. But the majority of us... The, 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 the majority of us had no clue that they had the uh, intention of selling Hydro One. And so they have no mandate to sell Hydro One. This is driven by the Premier and driven by her colleague, uh, a colleague uh, Ed Clark, uh, who's volunteering, the ex-TD uh, uh, president, who's volunteering for the government to come up with great ideas that uh, uh, that would, would, would help us all citizens and help the government in particular. Uh, so he came up with the idea of uh, uh, selling Hydro One. By the way, his son is uh, uh, right up in the hierarchy of the public, public uh, um, of the uh, public infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure Ontario. Help me there, Peter. Infrastructure Ontario, you nailed it. Uh, he's, a, he's a big shot there in the Infrastructure Ontario, which is that agency that uh, basically uh, manages the public-private partnerships. So between Ed Clark and his son, we have a great team, one volunteering, the other one well paid in the, uh, in the uh, Infrastructure Ontario, to come up with a scheme for, uh, for, for any infrastructure construction. Uh, under the name of public-private uh, partnerships. And the Liberals came up with a different term. That was a Tory term. The Liberals came up with the idea of uh, uh, renaming it so it wouldn't sound so bad. And it's called, Peter? Uh, oh, yeah. Alternative, Alternative financing. financing. And procurement. And procurement. How did I forget? So, so the Liberals thought by renaming it, uh, they think that they could uh, somehow make it sound uh, different and nicer. But, but it's all the same. The, there's nothing different uh, in that scheme. But this scheme is nothing new. We are beginning to privatize more and more. The government has no choice. If we don't increase taxes, income taxes or corporate taxes, we're in trouble. McGinty, while he was still there as a premier, cut income taxes, and he proudly said, we cut income taxes. He had a deficit of $20 billion, and they cut income taxes. <coughs> it made no sense. We needed money to bring in, to bring down the, the, the deficit, not to talk about the debt, which is 280 billion, but, but uh, uh, he proudly said, we, we're cutting income taxes. So the, the, the problem is that unless we bring, we raise income taxes and corporate taxes, we're gonna be in trouble forever. Services will continue to be dropped, user fees will continue to be raised, and privatization will continue to be uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the method by which we're, we're going to be uh, selling off our public assets. So this is the, this is the problem we, we've, we've got. And what are, what are we trying to do about it? Well, through OPSA, what we've done is to have meetings across the province. So we had a meeting in Ottawa. We had a meeting in Thunder Bay. A couple of meetings there in Thunder Bay. Uh, two, two meetings in Windsor where we're working with Ken Lowenza um, and, and others. Um, we've been in Scarborough, we've been in uh, uh, Brampton, we have been, uh, where else have we been? Toronto, Danforth. 
<laughs> Try those down for me. Uh, we, we, have, we have traveled uh, all over the place having meetings and there and through those meetings set up what we call local chapters. And the idea is that the local chapters are the ones that continue with the activity that we all talk about. And much of that activity is based on community organizing, visits to the local MPP, because a lot of people, whether we like it or not, don't visit the MPPs. And my argument is that the visit to the MPP is the most powerful thing you could do. And I'll tell you, as a, as a, as a former MPP, rarely did I get more than three people to speak on any one issue. Rarely. Now, they might have been complaining about an issue, but they never went to the office to tell me I disagree with this or that. And so if you've got 10, 15, 20, or 30 people coming to your office telling you that what you're doing is wrong, that it's a mistake, and that we're never going to vote for you again, that, in my view, is powerful. But we, very few of us do it. So the idea is to organize in, uh, in those communities where MPPs are vulnerable. And I believe MPPs are vulnerable. I believe the majority of liberal MPPs oppose the sale of Hydro One. It's driven by the Premier and she is sticking to it. But that doesn't mean the MPPs are not profoundly worried about the implications it's going to have on them in the next election. So any organizing we're doing, uh, such as the canvassing that is happening in Peter Tevin's writing and uh, uh, in Davenport with uh, Jonah Shine, uh, where Tina and I and others went and uh, canvassed uh, uh, people's homes to, to sign the petitions. All these activities are, are, are important. And I believe that many liberal MPPs are vulnerable. And if we just stick to, to our canvassing and our meetings in those local areas and mobilize people in those local areas on a regular basis, I believe eventually one of those liberals will crack. We just need one local MPP to crack. And I think it's possible. But even if they don't, they're incredibly vulnerable and afraid. Which is why I say we need to continue with that, with the, uh, with the organizing in, in the writings of uh, uh, liberal MPPs. I'm just going to have two minutes. I almost covered covered everything. The 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 point of uh, uh, that the last point I wanted to make was about um, my belief that a politician should be made accountable. We cannot make a politicians accountable unless you make us accountable. If you don't engage me and people are not engaged and they don't engage their local MPPs, we will not be made accountable. And that's that's part of the information and the mobilization of people to make every political party ca accountable. It doesn't matter which party is in power. The point is to inform, to engage, and through engagement, hopefully, uh, keep people, uh, keep politicians accountable. By the way, I wanted to tell you that the government says quickly that we will be able to regulate rates, that we've got the Ontario Energy Board uh, uh, in place. We had the Ontario Energy Board in place for, for a long time, particularly when, when these rates went up. The fact that the Ontario Energy Board is there to protect us doesn't mean that while they were there, rates don't go up. And as we privatize more of our energy, uh, of our energy particularly Hydro One in this case, rates will continue to go up. Remember 1999, when rates went up, we devastated Northern Ontario. The pulp and paper mills shut down. They could not afford the rates. Where did they go? Quebec and Manitoba, because hydro rates there are public. Because hydro is public in those two provinces. Rates will go up. The, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce estimates that one in 20 businesses will go down. We know that the rates are very, very sensitive for, the, uh, for, for, uh, for business. And in the sector, like pulp and paper and the auto industry, it's going to be hurtful. Rates will go up and it will affect business and it will affect individuals. But fundamentally, we have to stop the privatization of Hydro One because if we don't stop the privatization of Hydro One, they will, have it, they, they will take it as a sign that they can continue to privatize other things.